Okay, the first thing we want to do in getting really a huge boost on the way to your working on your syntactical analysis of your chosen text is to take a look at some exegetically significant grammatical elements in the Hebrew. There are 12 of them that you need to be aware of. Now if you have your syllabus, your course syllabus, you will find that in this syllabus on pages 78 to 102 you have a section that is dedicated to syntactical analysis. It begins on page 78 by discussing the distinctions between the usage of the perfect and imperfect forms of the verb uh, which you should have read and uh, we will be covering that in more detail uh, perhaps even today before we leave for pizza and then on page 82 you have the beginning of what we're talking about here so if you have your syllabus and if you have it open to page 82 you can follow along with what we're talking about here and you can see the respective sections of various grammars that deal with these 12 uh, exegetically significant elements in Hebrew grammar. At the end of that section on page 87 you have some recommended resources for Hebrew grammar and syntax. Those are the types of resources that you should be utilizing to uh, prepare your syntactical analysis over the next several weeks. On page 89 of the syllabus you have a sample of what your exegetical paper should be like. Now please do not put a title exactly like it is on page 89 uh, that's put there to let you know uh, different things you've done. Remember you have to have a title page. Um, uh, a formal title page as you would use for any formal paper or thesis should be provided. And that heading, the running head up there at the top with page 89 and OT603 and all of that, that should not be on any of your papers. Uh, you should have it, uh, it, probably no running head at all and just a page number up there in the upper right hand corner. But notice I've double spaced this so you can see what it would look like because you have to do yours double spaced. For several years I gave a single spaced example and students kept turning in theirs single spaced. So I decided I better do it differently and show you exactly what it should look like double spaced. It, you have a brief introduction that will be in your paper and you go through verse by verse, word by word or phrase by phrase and you discuss it and this sample will help you to see exactly how to do that and you have footnotes, formal footnotes as you go through. So if you can go through that and take a look at that, that goes all the way over to page 98 and on page 98 you also see that there's a summary or conclusion to your syntactical analysis, brief in nature not extra lengthy. And if you go through this you'll have a good idea of what your syntactical analysis paper should be like and you can follow that basic pattern. Then on pages 99 to 102 you have a uh, biblical index, a scripture index for Putnam's Hebrew Bible insert so that you might utilize it as you work on your text and passage. So let's begin by talking about these elements of Hebrew grammar that I have identified as exegetically and expositionally significant. What do I mean by that? First of all, they're exegetically significant because they provide major elements of meaning for the text with which you are dealing. When you open the scriptures in English and you start reading, what do you watch for? You watch for key words. You watch for the verbs. You try to find out who is the subject of the sentence or what is the subject of the sentence. If there's a direct object for an active verb, what the direct object is. If there are causal clauses or their purpose clauses, you look for those kinds of things. And the same in Hebrew. Uh, you don't open your English Bible and say, well, I've got to find every use of of, O-F and they are going to determine how I preach this message. You don't do that. That's not exegetically and expositionally significant. It's not insignificant because it contributes to the meaning of the passage, but it's not weighted as a priority in the exegetical and expositional significance of the text. So we're going to look at what you look for in the Hebrew. That when you see a certain construction or a certain element of grammar in the Hebrew text, you know that you must pay attention to it. You know 
that it is exegetically significant. It has meaning that you want to know about in order to rightly understand the text. And it is exposition, expositionally significant because you want to in some way find a way to communicate the truths of that text and what is implied or specified by that grammatical element when you're preaching. Okay, So let's remember these. The very first one has to do with something you're very familiar with. And we've had that in the translation in Genesis chapter 3. We have a chain of Wayyik told verbs. That's the framework for every narrative. Whenever you're preaching narrative in the Old Testament, those Wayyik told verbs are providing the sequence of events that take place within that narrative. They are significant. You want to pay attention to them. You want to determine if there's any break in that chain of sequential verbs. You want to find out if there's any Wayyik Tol form that is uh, a, instead of being a sequential, is explanatory or starts a new chain of events or has some other meaning. You want to identify them especially because those are where the junctures or the joints or the seams in the narrative appear that will tell you when you have entered one scene and then left it and entered another scene. So the why you told verbs are very important for you. If you're in a narrative it tells the story and it tells it as a historical account of a sequence of events and occurrences that take place. The Wayyik Tol verb, uh, we'll talk about more later. Uh, when you look at it, remember that the and or the wow conjunction on it is to be looked at as not something that converts the verb. Uh, the old style of talking about the Wayyik Tol was to say this was a wow conversive. That it converted a future or present tense to a past tense. As you found out by reading uh, uh, your textbook by Chisholm, uh, that is absolute nonsense. And uh, no one holds to that anymore. Ask Practico and Van Pelt in their publishing of their brand new grammar at back about, uh, what was it, 1996, 1997. They included a chapter that had a heading that was the wow conversive, talking about why you told. Uh, it was no more than fresh off the presses when they were bombarded by Hebraists from around the world who had seen this new book and said, what in the world are you thinking? The wow conversive is outdated. It's, it's abandoned. It's, it's no longer seen as a viable view. It's linguistically unsound. It, it is, it doesn't, it, no one holds to it anymore. Why do you have that in your book? And they suddenly realized their mistake and wrote a brand new chapter and then they couldn't get the publisher to insert the new chapter. Because they said, uh, we have thousands of copies of this book. We're going to sell them first before we make any changes. <laughs> so they put up a website in which they published the new chapter in which they got rid of the WOW Conversive and then later editions now have that chapter changed. So it's something that this wow conversive that converts to a past tense does not occur and does not happen. Never think of it that way. A wayik toll can be in the past tense, the present tense, or the future tense. Tense is determined by context. The, cle the, the, the clear meaning, the central focus of the wayik toll is primarily its use to show sequence. That's why we call it a wow consecutive. It is a wow consecutive. Now on the other side we have the wekatal, the wow plus perfect. That's not conversive either. It does not convert a past tense into a future tense. The wekatal can be found in past, present, or future depending upon context. Context alone determines tense or time for the actions of the Hebrew verb. Context alone never the form. We'll point that out in Chisholm. Chisholm makes that statement about three different times in his textbook. And every viable grammar will make that kind of statement and make certain that you properly understand it. That time is determined by context. 
The Wekatal is found primarily in prophetic literature, whereas the Wayik Tol is found primarily in narrative literature. That has led to that misconception that these are tenses. It's just the fact, gentlemen, that in the Wayik Tol you have a sequential verb. You have a wow consecutive. Therefore, when you're talking about past events, when you're narrating someone's life and telling the order of events in which things occur, you want to use the sequential verb form. And the type of genre, the setting for it, of being in historical narrative determines the tense, that it's past tense. That same verb form can be used in present tense contexts, say in the Psalms, to talk about a sequence of events that are present. And even in prophetic literature, the Wayik Tol can be used to, to talk about a sequence of future events because it's talking about sequence. But you see, the problem with the future is it's not here yet. And therefore, we do not know completely the order of all prophetic events. We have a general idea of their logical relationship. Therefore, the prophets used the Wekatal because it is a logical uh, relationship that it focuses on instead of a sequential relationship. Therefore, we call it a wow correlative. So wow consecutive, and this will be on your final exam, so you better learn it well. A wow consecutive represents the wayik tol. A wow correlative represents the wekatal. Okay? Again, just keep in mind, one is sequential primarily, not solely, not only, but primarily sequential, and found primarily in narrative. And the Wekatal, on the other hand, is found primarily in prophetic literature, and it is primarily logical relationship that it focuses upon. The Wayik Tol still does not destroy the peculiar and specific uh, aspects and usages of the Yik Tol. That's why it's still called Wayik Tol. It is still an imperfect, all right? So it is a wow consecutive imperfect form of the verb. The wow consecutive does not refer to the wow alone. It refers to that wow on that verb form. A wow consecutive is the same as saying wow ye tol, and it includes the verb. The same with the wow correlative. It's not just the wow. The wow correlative is the wekatal. It's the wow plus perfect. So try to keep that in mind and when you're writing your papers, maintain a consistency in your terminology. All right? Don't call the wow a wow, uh, a wow consecutive or the wow a wow correlative. It is the verb form. It's wayik tol. That wow with an A-class vowel under it on a yik tol, an imperfect, that is a wow consecutive. And the wow correlative is the simple wow with schwa on a perfect form of the verb. That is while correlative. Notice where katal includes the name of the verb form, katal. All right, let's move on to the second element. You've identified all the verbs in your text. That's the first thing you want to do as you're going through your text. Identify every single verb. Make certain you can parse them. Parse them in your syntactical analysis. Make certain you understand the relationships that are set up by those verbs. Any sequences, any logical relationships. And then take a look at disjunctive clauses. Disjunctive clauses are a wow plus a non verb. Those form disjunctive clauses. Disjunctive clauses have two primary uses. The first use is to show a contrast. That's where we have the word but to be used in translation. For example, your desire shall be for your husband, but he will rule over you. Why? Because you have a wow plus a non-verb in that last line of Genesis uh, 3, uh, 16. All right? Disjunctive clause. Don't use but for wayik tol on, uh, except in those very rare, rare, rare cases where it is adversative or, or contrastive. But is going to be used in a lot of uses where you have wow plus non-verb. 
especially where you have the non-verb that comes first but you also have a verb still so that you can see that the change in order was to bring about that contrast. So the while plus non-verb. First usage is primarily that of ad adversity meaning of being a contrast. Translate with but. The other meaning is background information. Background information. Like in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2 where we have wehaaretz hayata tohu wavohu and the wehaaretz, the wow on the noun haaretz, the earth, that is a disjunctive clause. It's obvious by context it's not adversative, it's not a contrast, it's not to be translated but. It's obvious by context that it is a, a parenthetical description giving background information and describing what the character of the earth was that God created in Genesis 1.1. So while plus non-verb disjunctive clauses, watch for them. They're significant because they provide contrast, they provide background information. Let's go to the third element. Macrosyntactic wehaya and wayahi. What we mean by macro syntactic is they go beyond the grammar of just a clause or sentence. We're here talking about the grammar of an entire section of scripture. Perhaps verses in length or sometimes even chapters in length that are introduced by one of these two verb forms. Wehaya, the wow plus haya Cal, perfect, third, masculine, singular, the verb that means be, and it was, or and he was, depending on context, it might not even be translated when it is used macrosyntactically. And you have wayahi. This is a wayik tol form of the verb. It is a wow consecutive, and it is an imperfect, third, masculine, singular, from the same verb, haya, be. And it, in the imperfect, is a dynamic state, even will be become. And so, and it became. Now, that doesn't mean that every time you see wayahi or every time you see wehaya, they are macrosyntactic, because they're not always macrosyntactic. They're macrosyntactic when they begin a major section and govern that section. And one of the things to remember about wayahi especially is that wayahi in such situations almost always takes a meaning like when. And then the main verb comes later. Wayahi is not the main verb. So watch for those. See if you have them in your text. Yes? So the, the macrosyntactical wayahi, is that, that would typically translate something like then it came about? Uh, no, it's typically translated just when, because it's in such a context that it's not the main verb. It usually introduces an adverbial clause that modifies the main verb, and it's often temporal. And so it'll be introducing that when clause. In other words, uh, if, in fact, those who argue that uh, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth is the way to translate Genesis 1-1, if that were really true, it probably would have began with the wayahi, and it does not. So it's usually wayahi in a macro syntactic usage, not every usage. Remember, wayahi is used in situations like wayahi uh, erev, uh, uh, wayahi voker. Uh, it's seven times, six times in, in uh, Genesis 1. You have six times used, and it became, or then it became evening, and it became morning. Those are both wayahi. So uh, it's not necessarily... Uh, macrosyntactic. There it's not macrosyntactic. When God said let there be light, he says yehior, let light come into being, let it happen. And then we have or and light happened. Wayahi there is not used macrosyntactically. All right, yes? So you have to examine the, the, the very large context sometimes to determine whether it's macrosyntactic. Absolutely. Because macrosyntactic is dealing with the greater context. It's not dealing with just that verse or just that clause. It's dealing with an entire section of scripture. And so you'll see that in narrative used that way. And the wehaya you'll see primarily in prophetic literature. But you'll also find it on occasion within historical narrative. So watch for these. Let's go to the fourth element. Modal verbs. 
And you said, oh, I knew we were going to get to something painful sooner or later, right? Because probably in your first year of Hebrew, trying to identify such things as imperatives, cohortatives, and jussives, and how you translate those verbs may have occupied a good deal of your labor, sweat, toil, and pain, right? And these verbs are very important. Think about it. How you say something determines the meaning that comes across and how people react to it. If I say, uh, I want you to go to the store. That's very different than saying, get out of here, there's a fire, right? Which one do I use the imperative for? Get out of here, right? The imperative gives a sense of urgency. There's a command. And it is one person telling another person what to do. And so we want to pay attention, especially if it's God speaking, and he is the one speaking the imperative. It is exegetically and it is expositionally significant. What does God want his people to do? And the jussive. The jussive expresses desire, it expresses uh, uh, wishes, it expresses allowance and permission. We translate the jussives with verbs like could, should, would. I would do this, I should do this, I could do this. You see, those are jussives. Let him do this. You may do this. Remember what Eve said to the serpent? She said, we may eat from the fruit of the trees of the garden, right? No kale. The cal imperfect, first common plural from a cal, and it is jussive by context. Remember, this is one of the problems you faced in studying the jussives, is the jussives have a shortened form in the hyphial, where you have the hierikyod infix descends to just a tseri and no yod. But it doesn't do that in any other forms. And it has a shortened form if you have a final hey verb. Like asa drops that final hey and shortens up as a jussive sometimes. So there are certain forms of the verb in the imperfect. And remember all jussives are imperfects. And all cohortatives are imperfects. And all imperatives are imperatives. They have an imperatival form, but all imperatives were derived from the second person of the imperfect. You just drop the prefix, the tau prefix off, and there you have your imperative. So all these three modal verbs are derived from the imperfect form of the verb. And therefore they partake of some of the characteristics of the imperfect. And the imperfect, one of the keys to the imperfect in its use in scripture is you have to watch to see what mood it is. If it's the mood of reality, you see, that's one thing. But what about the mood of irreality? And what about the mood that we even go so far as have an optative? There is an optative in Hebrew as well, but it has a totally different type of form and is somewhat rare. And uh, we'll talk about it another day. But imperatives, justice, and cohortives. Remember, cohortive is the idea of encouraging one another. Let us do something, right? It's hortatory. Hortatory. You're exhorting someone to do something. It's the same as the hortatory subjunctive in Greek. Let us do something. Let's go do this. That's cohortative. And uh, it, it's the cohortative is the plural first person. The justive or primarily the plural first person, and, in, and you have in the uh, singular first person, you can have cohortative, but it's more like I am determined to do something or I wish to do something in the cohortative, in the first person. The jussive is not found in the first person. The jussive is found in third person primarily and occasionally in second person. The imperative is second person. So the moods are divided by person. Imperatives are second person imperatives. We don't have to say second person when we parse them because all imperatives are second person automatically. So all you have to say is imperative. Cal imperative, masculine, singular. Leave off the two. It's not needed. Uh, PL imperative, uh, third feminine plural. Or uh, excuse me, feminine plural. Just leave off the two. You don't have to say second feminine plural for the imperatives. But the jussives are third person. There are a few second person 
just these. Very few. How do they differ from the imperative? The imperative doesn't have a prefix. And the imperative is a stronger form of the verb. In Greek, Greek uh, professors and Greek students put all these type things into one category, subjunctive. The jussive is a type of subjunctive. The cohortative is a type of subjunctive. Learn what they are. Learn what uses they are. Watch for the variety and remember this. The cohortative and jussive are determined by context, not by form. There's only rare forms that uh, the form actually changes to show the jussive. And the cohortatives sometimes show a difference in form because some of them take a comet's hay on the end and some of them add the little particle na, but not all of them. So cohortative and jussive is determined by context. All right? The participle of the imminent future. This is the fun one. If you want to express the urgency of a situation and you are telling the person, now this is your uh, condition and this is why I'm asking you to act so urgently. You are sitting on the train track and the Metrolink is traveling at 80 miles an hour and it is 100 feet from your body you are about to be creamed. How do you say that in Hebrew? You begin it with hine, behold. You continue it with the personal pronoun ata, and then you continue with a participle. In this case, dokeik. Hine ata dokeik. You are about to be smashed. <laughs> All right? And what does that mean? How imminent is that? When God told Ezekiel, I am about to take your wife from you, she died that night. That's how imminent it is. When uh, the Messiah says to Zechariah the prophet, Behold, I am about to come and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, the daughter of Zion. Behold, I am about to come. It took him another 400 years. So the context determines how imminent it is, but it has the imminent idea. It's hine plus the pronoun or pronominal suffix, because you could just put a pronominal suffix on the end too. You could have hine ni, which is behold I am coming. Hine ni bo, or ba, excuse me, in this case, ba. Hine ni ba, behold I am coming. That means I am about to come. And th looking at the uh, future uh, imminence here. This, this verb dominates in the plagues of Egypt in the book of Exodus. When God announces the plagues, Moses and Aaron announce it using this form of the participle. He nay plus a pronoun or pronominal suffix plus the participle to say this is about to happen. It's imminent. And in some cases it happened the minute they walked out of Pharaoh's presence. That's how imminent. Other times it waited to another time of the day to occur. It occurs heavily in the book of Zechariah talking about prophetic elements and things that are about to happen to Israel and to Jerusalem. Watch for this. Okay? Yes, sir? Uh, is the you there, is it translatable at all? Is it because it's always used in direct <coughs> discourse or is it just kind of, uh, that's the form it takes? Okay, first of all, I, I've got to understand exactly what you're talking about. You're talking about what part of the participle oh, sorry, or the... Um, the, the, ta, the second person pronoun. Oh, that's trans translated you, yeah. Behold, you are about to be creamed. You have to translate it. Okay. All right, you don't, don't ignore it. You can't, you can't ignore a pronoun. Oh, so ever. I was, I was confused because I thought you said it's always a second person. No, no, no. No, just no I gave pronoun. the example I gave okay. used the second person. And I gave you another example that used first person. Okay, it's just hine plus any pronoun any personal pronoun. All right? It can be uh, third masculine singular who, it can be third feminine singular he, it can be third masculine plural haim, it can be, y you go on down the list, it can be any pronoun or pronominal suffix. Either one. All right? He nay plus the pronoun or, or a pronominal suffix plus the participle. That determines the participle of the imminent future. Yes, sir? Um, a number of texts I've read seem to indicate that we're not to translate the hine 
specifically as something like the whole. Right. What would, how would you we suggest that we actually impart that urgency? Okay, good question. How do we treat hine? In the case of the uh, imminent future participle, you don't translate it. Because it, it is part of the construction that is showing imminency. So you just say, I am about to come. You don't have to say, behold, I'm about to come. There are places in context where hine will be translated as look or behold. There are places in, ver in uh, dream narratives, like in Genesis 37, where Hine introduces each new panel, each new vision of the dream, each new scene in the dream. You don't translate in that situation either. That's what Putnam's talking about in section 3.3.3 .3 when he goes through that. All right? So participle imminent future, you got the idea? The full form of it is Hine plus the personal pronoun or pronominal suffix followed by the participle. Now, some forms shorten up. They'll have hine and move immediately to the participle. No pronoun, no pronoun suffixes. And in some contexts, you'll find that by context, the participle by itself expresses imminent future. This is why we say and why Chisholm says over and over again, context, context, context. Context determines the timing of your verbs, the timing of the participles. Context tells you whether it's present. Context tells you whether it's past. Context tells you whether it is future. Okay? Now, let's go from that one. Participial usages. When we have a participle, there are two major uses, characteristic and continuous. If we look out the window, and we see a horse down there on the lawn next to the chapel. I could look at that horse and I could be talking to you and I would make a comment like, horses eat hay. In Hebrew, the word eat would be a participle because it expresses characteristic action. Okay? Now, if I'm looking there and I say, well, look at that. That horse is eating an apple. Eating can also use the Hebrew participle, if we express it in Hebrew, because it's talking about continuous action. You expect to be able to walk over there and watch the horse eat the apple, because we caught him in the act, it's in the process of eating, and so a participle is used. Whenever you have a participle in your text that you're working on, you have to ask yourself the question, is this participle, if it is a verbal participle, remember participles can be used as nouns, they're not always verbs. Okay? You check to see if it's used as a noun or a verb. If it's used as a verb, then ask the question, is it being used as a participle expressing continuous action or characteristic action? Characteristic action we normally translate in the present tense. The sun rises every day. Rises would be a Hebrew participle showing characteristic action. It's characteristic. Man breathes the air. Participle. Characteristic action. Present tense translation. Continuous action. The sun is crossing the sky. Participle. Continuous action. Okay? Yes, sir? Kind of like in uh, Genesis 3 where it says, and she gave me the fruit and so I ate. I noticed, maybe I'm remembering it wrong, but the ate is like in a participle form and so I, was, I thought I was, I was like thinking maybe it translated so I was eating but it's it's so I ate is that like characteristic okay first of all uh, the reason it looked like a participle is that it is a uh, remember the one of the rules we said last week to remember when you have a tran uh, problem translating you have to take a look and see if there is a guttural involved that verb form a cal is a uh, guttural olive on the beginning of it. The verb akal, he ate, begins with an olive. So when you have I ate, and notice there you had a wow with a comets under it. The wow with the comets tells you that is a wayik tol form of the verb, therefore it cannot be a participle. It is a yik tol. It's an imperfect. And the reason the olive had a holum over it is because the olive of the prefix of the cal imperfect first common singular is combined with the aleph of the root letter 
And so it changes form and it changes vowels and akal has a special form. It's a weak verb. And so okale, wa okale is not a participle. Wa okale is a cal imperfect first common singular from akal. And so you translate it as a wa yik tol form of the verb, not as a participle. Okay? <laughs> All right? Yeah. Anytime you have that, no, and notice, and that's why you translate it, so I ate. The result, that's part of the Wayik Tol. Wayik Tol shows a sequence there of result. She gave me the fruit, so I ate. And you translate that, not as and I ate, but so I ate, to show that result. It's a direct result. It's a direct consequence. It's a sequential result of giving the fruit. He ate, so he ate. Yes, sir. I assume the same thing is happening with Wayomayu, which we see often in narrative. The is exact the same thing. Is it there a reason why it becomes a holem? Yes, it's because of the uh, initial olive that it becomes a holem. That uh, form, uh, when you have initial olive uh, in uh, the Hebrew verb forms, that uh, instead of using a uh, hirik under the yod prefix as other normal cal forms, it moves to a holem. And instead of using an A-class vowel under the second root letter, it often uses an E-class vowel. As in Wayomer, you have a holem over the yod prefix, and you have a uh, uh, segol under the main. And it's because it's a pay olive. It's an initial olive, a one olive verb. Okay? Remember, gutturals are what you've got to remember. Gutturals do not behave normally. And when a guttural is in play in a verb form, you're going to have a little bit of a mess created for you. And you can't depend on it taking the exact same form you're used to in the paradigms of a strong verb form like shamer or katal. Okay, Aaron? Do the characteristic and continuous usages have any correlation between active and passive forms or is it just context? No, it's just context. The passive and active forms, for example, you have a cal active participle or a cal passive participle, you ask the same two questions. Is it characteristic or is it continuous? Same questions abide. Okay? About the only place you end up with something different is when you have, for example, the nifal participle. The nifal participle, and we'll talk about this later on, is primarily used adjectivally. We saw that in Genesis 3.6 where you had the, the, the participle, the nifal participle, masculine singular, uh, nechmad, and that meant desirable. And most nifal participles used as adjectives, you put an I-B-L-E or A-B-L-E on them, and you have the meaning of that participle. And in that case, it's not being used as a regular verb you have to ask whether it's uh, continuous or characteristic. Most nifal participles are going to be used adjectivally. Okay, let's go to the next one. Cognate infinitive absolutes. We talked about this last week a little bit. We saw that in the slides here. By the way, I posted the PowerPoint uh, 01 Chisholm on the uh, uh, course page in Jewel under course documents so that you have copies. In fact, this PowerPoint is on there for you to download. And uh, you, you can have either one of these look at them and we'll continue to do that. When I've almost finished a series on PowerPoint, I will be putting that on there so that you can see it and you can utilize it to help you study and to review what you've gone over in class. The cognate infinitive absolutes. Cognate means from the same root. In other words, you have two verbs. One is an infinitive absolute, and one is either an imperfect or a perfect. But they're from the same root. They're either both from shamer. If you have one is shamer, the other one has to be from shamer. Or from katav, or whatever. Whatever the verb, they will have identical roots. That's why we call them cognate. The infinitive absolute, remember that's in the uh, cal. Remember it's that katol, shamor form. In fact, it's so easy to remember the uh, absolute, infinitive absolute, because the vowels in absolute, the first two vowels are the same vowels you see in uh, the uh, form in the uh, uh, cal. The A, ka, o, tol, katol, shamor, okay, malok, a, so, abso. There's your pointing of the cal infinitive absolute right there. Forget about the U and the E. The first two are all I'm looking at, all right? 
the infinity of absolutes. Now, what is the meaning of the infinity of absolutes to use that way? Remember last week we said if you put the infinity of absolute first, like in mot tamut, mot cal infinity of absolute from mut, and you have tamut, second, the cal imperfect second masculine singular from mut, you put that in that order, mot tamut, that means you will certainly die. You will definitely die. You will surely die. That's the concept. It is intensive. All right? Now, if the infinity of absolute comes after it, if we said tamut mot, that means you're going to keep on dying. All right? So the when you have the infinity of absolute that precedes, that's prepositioned, that is in that first position before the other form of the verb, that is intensive. If it comes after, it is continuative. It is continuous action. Cognate infinity of absolutes. Watch for them. They're always emphatic. They're always emphatic. They're not used for no reason at all. <laughs> They're used in order to emphasize something. The infinitive constructs are our next group. The eighth element, grammatical element. Yes, sir? Yes. Either I will surely increase your pain or yes. I will greatly increase Yes, correct. Your pain. Using the PL form of Rava. Is there um, a way you can tell whether, why it's not I will greatly increase your pain? It's no, you can translate it that way. You can translate it, I will greatly increase or I will certainly increase or I will surely increase. I will definitely increase. Uh, the reason that many translate it, I will greatly increase is because the meaning of the root uh, form of the, of the word. I mean, it, it has the idea of to increase in it. And so uh, if, you're, if you're certainly going to increase, it's the idea of I'll greatly increase. Okay, so either way. Okay. I think on your translation notes, you mentioned that it should be surely. Uh, well, surely fits better. I mean, you can translate as greatly, but then you have to answer a question. How much more great is the increase of pain and of conception that God is talking about. If after all he told the unfallen Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, you know, then how does this now differ from that? Are they going to fill the earth faster? Is that what you mean by greatly increase? How much pain would she have ex expected to experience naturally as an unfallen woman in an unfallen world at childbirth? Obviously, since it's going to increase, there was then pain. Pain is not sin. Pain is not the result of sin. All pain is not the result of sin. Pain is a natural protection mechanism built into the body that God created. Adam and Eve had nerve endings. Adam and Eve could feel pain. It's how they protected themselves. It's how they knew that if they, they uh, put their hand on a tree that had a thorn on it, that that thorn could go through the hand. They'd take it off because of the pain. Or if uh, there was dust in the air or anything of that nature, you know, the pain on the eye would cause them to, to blink. So pain is not anything that's the result the direct result of sin, there is a pain that would be there in the created being. So how much more pain then is there in childbirth now as there would have been in the unfallen state? That's hard to quantify. So that's why I'm reluctant to use greatly, but I'm not going to say it can't be used. It's just a matter of relative. What, how much more greater is it? And so if you're going to translate greatly, be prepared for the questions. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. All right? You'll find this out. In translation, there are varieties of ways to say things that are potential, that are possible, and are grammatically accurate. It's the context and the overall picture that will determine which choice you make. Okay? Yes, sir? With the post positive form, um, would you recommend in English translation adding words like continue to or keep on? Or should we just use some like a participle form just to show that it's continuous? No, I would, I would suggest you add. Always say something like you just keep on doing this. You just keep on or this will keep on or, or this will continuously be. Yes, you have to add those. And when you add those, do not put them in italics. 
because you're not adding to the text. You are expressing the grammar of the text. The text put the verb twice and you're not going to translate the verb twice. You're going to translate the verb once. So what are you going to do with the other verb? That's what's involved in that adverbial phraseology that you're putting in there. Okay? Everyone got that? Understand that? You don't translate certainly on you will certainly die. Remember there's two verb forms. There are two words there. Mot tamuth. Dying you shall die. But if you translate that way that is a mistranslation that gives a misconception. It gives the wrong meaning and so you just say you shall die but how do you represent the infinitive absolute? You have to represent it by the adverbial intensifying element that it brings. That is it is the reason for. It is the cause of. It is in the text and it must be represented. So that certainly is not italicized. Yes sir? Just to be clear so then if we see two cognates together, it's always a CIA? If it is an infinitive absolute and an imperfect or perfect. Okay. Only in those situations, not other cognates. There are many other cognates. Jacob dreamed a dream. There you have the verb dream and you have the direct object noun dream that are cognates. That's not an infinitive, uh, that's not a cognate infinitive absolute. But if it is an infinitive absolute and, and two verbs? Yes. That's correct. All right. Now let's talk about infinitive constructs. Infinitive constructs can also be exciting because they can express purpose. They can express time. They can express duration. They can express uh, all kinds of things. Causation. Whether you have a Lamed prefix on an infinitive construct, whether you have a Beit prefix or a Min prefix or a Kaf prefix, those are all significant. Watch for your infinitive absolutes. I mean infinitive constructs. The infinitive constructs often are paired together with another verb. Not the same root though. They're paired together with another verb to express a more complete thought from that verb. Uh, he is able to do this. In Hebrew you would use a form of the verb he is able and then you would follow it with an infinitive construct with a Lamed preposition to do. <coughs> All right. So infinitive constructs express purpose, they express result, they express time, uh, they express direction. Uh, there's many, many uses of the infinitive constructs. Pay attention to the prepositions that are used with them. And when you uh, identify the prepositions, if it's a Lamed, remember Lamed has 27 different possible translations in the English language. Because the Lamed preposition in Hebrew has 27 different kinds of usage. So don't always translate it just as two or four. There are many, many other uses of it. Go to your lexicon, open it up, walk through and look at every possible usage. And as you're looking at that, then determine which ones fit best in the context where you are translating. So you're working on one of your texts for your text for your paper on syntactical analysis. What do I expect you to write in there if you have a Lamed preposition on an infinitive construct? I expect you to identify it, number one, and properly parse it. Number two, I expect you to explain how it modifies or how it is related to a preceding verb because most infinitive constructs with prepositions are adverbial in nature and therefore modify a preceding verb. So what verb are they modifying? And how are they modifying it? And how do you translate that Lamed? Is it a case where it isn't translated? Which are a few. Is it to be translated as to? For? By, with, through, against, opposite. We can keep on going. There's a whole bunch of them. How do you translate it? And you'll look at that and you'll say, well, there's 27 different usages. And three of those look like they could fit my context. Well, that's all I'm asking of you at that point. That you've uh, reduced the entire field down to three that are the most likely and at that stage you're still saying I'm really not certain which of these I'm supposed to do and which is correct then put that in your paper. Put that in your syntactical analysis. 
I've boiled this down to three possible meanings or usages in this context. I have not yet decided which one it is. And then tell me which one you're leaning toward and why. And then move on. Why? You have a whole year to live with this text. Hopefully by the end of a full year you will figure out which of those three is the right one. So this paper is not to be a final product that is polished and ready to be published as the final word on that passage. As a commentary you're going to ask everyone to buy, they're going to try to download it on Kindle, Logos is going to put it in digital format and all that. No. This is a project you're doing here, a year long project that is in process. And so as you write the syntactical analysis papers, they, there will be places and times when you will not be able to reach a dogmatic conclusion or an absolute conclusion. And you may have a range of possibilities. Describe the range. Try to limit it as much as possible for the time being. Don't waste more sleep on it. Don't tell your wife you can't help her with the dishes because you've got to decide on that final meaning of the Lamed on the infinitive construct, you say, okay, honey, I've got it down to three. That's good enough for Dr. Berrick. I'll help you with the dishes, okay? Got that? I know, everyone is going to go home and tell your wife that, right? First of all, you're going to say, Dr. Berrick must be really old-fashioned. They must not have a dishwasher. He helps his wife wash dishes or something of that nature. But uh, either, either way, I want you to look at this as a project that's in process, not that has to be at every stage in a state of perfection because you're going to continue to learn about this as we go along. So, and we'll talk about this next week. When you bring your computers and we're working on these things on syntactical analysis, you'll be dealing with specific examples right in front of you. You'll be dealing with it and talking about it with two or three other people, well, one or two other people, because you have no larger group than three. And you'll be talking about it amongst yourselves. You'll, if you have a question, you raise your hand. I'll walk to your table. I'll help you with it. I'll tell you some of the things to observe or to look at. And we'll work through those things. So that when you turn in that paper, it'll be probably the first paper you've done at seminary that had lab time in class given over to help you get personal instruction on what you're doing and whether you're doing it the right way. That's the whole purpose of it to have lab time so that you get the most out of this exercise because this is a process of exegesis that you're going to be using the rest of your life in reading God's word. So we're going to work at it. Okay, let's go to the next one. Miscellaneous macrosyntactic particles. What do I mean? Hine. We just talked about that earlier. It has a wide range of uses. How is it used in your text? Weata. Weata is not to be always translated as and now. Atta by itself is a temporal particle meaning now at the present time. It's the now that I tell you is legitimately translated now in your translations. Atta. But weata is a compound particle. Sometimes it's and now, but other times it is a summary particle meaning therefore. Therefore. It's something like un or ara un in the uh, uh, Greek side of things. In Hebrew we have other particles used with therefore. We have alkane, literally upon thus. Also means therefore. Uh, so look at it and see. Uh, remember, yeah, I think if you've had enough Greek exegesis by this point, you've probably heard this old saying. If you see the particle un in the text, meaning therefore, Ask what it's there for. Maybe you heard that in English. In English Bible. If you find a therefore in the text, ask what the therefore is there for. Because it's summarized. What does it summarize? How far back in the context does it go? You see it's macrosyntactical. So watch for those. There's other particles like rack. Rack means only, surely. It's very emphatic. Uh, you have other particles like af key that we saw when the serpent spoke to Eve and said, has God really said? Af key was used there, a compound. It's intensive. It's, it's a strong particle. Has he really said? Uh, those are the type of particles we're talking about. There are a lot of them in Hebrew. But you need to begin to know them and understand them. Uh, A.T. Robertson in his Greater Greek Grammar spoke of particles like this in the Greek as being those particles that give color to black and white. That's the way it is in Hebrew as well. 
particles give color to an otherwise black and white picture. It's like having a color TV because of what they bring to the text. Watch for those particles. Extraposition. Extraposition means a nominative absolute. A nominative absolute. That's when you have a noun used in the nominative case that is outside the structure of the sentence and unnecessary to the meaning of the sentence and is only there in order to bring emphasis as we had in Genesis 3. That woman, Ha-Isha, whom you gave to me, she, using he, the third feminine singular personal pronoun, she gave to me so I ate. Well, all you need there is she gave it to me, so I ate. That's the sentence. Why all this threefold upfront nominative absolutes in three different forms used? Because Adam is really trying to pass the buck emphatically. He's not going to take the blame. In fact, he's, while he's blaming his wife, he even blames God. You gave her to me. You're at fault. So the nominative absolute is to bring out focus, is to bring out emphasis. When you see a nominative absolute, when you see a noun that sits outside the grammatical structure of the sentence and can be discarded without changing the meaning of the sentence as a sentence, that's probably for emphasis. Okay? It's also called extraposition because it stands outside. Extra position, like extraterrestrial as someone from outside earth. So this is extraposition, a position outside the sentence. The accusative marker eighth, you say, wait a minute, accusative marker eighth? We don't even translate it. How can that have any exegetical or expositional significance? The exegetical significance of the eighth particle is it's never used on anything that is indefinite. When you have eighth on a noun or introducing a noun in the Hebrew text, whether or not that noun has a definite article, it is by means of that eighth made definite. And in some cases, the eighth is emphatic. And get this, a little exception you hadn't heard before. Eighth is found not just on accusatives, it can also be found on nouns that are in the nominative case. It is not always an accusative marker or a direct object marker. Beware. Watch out. Okay? Predicate adjectives is our twelfth and final exegetically and expositionally significant grammatical element in, the, in Biblical Hebrew. The predicate adjective is that adjective that normally comes first in the order of the sentence. It never takes the article on it. And it describes the noun or the, uh, the complement that's found in the predicate. So you can have God is great. How would you say that in Hebrew? You put the predicate adjective first without an article. Gadol Yahweh. Okay? Yahweh is great. Gadol Yahweh. What happens if I turn it around and say Yahweh Gadol? When I turn it around that means it is out of the normal word order, so therefore I've done this in order to say that Yahweh alone is great. Or for some other reason emphasizing Yahweh. If I want to say the great Yahweh, it's Yahweh Hagadol, because Yahweh is a proper name. It is always definite and it does not need to have the article. Since it is definite, then the adjective has to agree with that proper noun in gender, number, and definiteness. It is a masculine noun, it is a singular noun, and is a definite noun, therefore I have to use Hagadol, the great Yahweh. That's an attributive adjective, that's not the predicate adjective. The predicate adjective is where you have to add the word is in there, or was, or will be, depending on context. And you don't italicize that copula when you add it in because it's understood in the construction. So when you say Yahweh is great, Gadol Yahweh, there's no part of that that is italicized. Because every single part of that is represented in the Hebrew words and its grammar and is absolutely, completely necessary for the translation. 
Okay. Yes, sir. Laat acherev in Genesis three verse twenty four. Is that right? Is that a predicate adjective? Because I wasn't sure. No, it is not. No, it's the flame. Lachat is the flame or tongue of the sword. Cherev. Uh, and so it's, a, uh, it's in the construct state. It is two nouns side by side in construct relationship. The flame of the sword, the tongue of the sword, which means the blade of the sword. So the flaming sword is a terrible translation. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's not what I would prefer. Let's put it that way. But it's not anything that will get you an eye on it. It might get you a question mark. It might even get you a second question mark. <laughs> but you're not going to lose any points. Why do I say that? It's the same question we had earlier. It is legitimate because lachat can mean flame or tongue of flame. And uh, it, is, it is possible. I mean the reason that the sword's blade is referred to as lachat is that it's shiny and it, the sun glints off of it. And it can look like a flame, uh, a tongue of flame, especially when you're holding it up. So it's, it's really a figurative language application to describe the uh, sword blade. And if it's a flaming sword, I mean, uh, how else would the Hebrew writer say it if it was a flaming sword? Maybe somewhat similar. And so I'm not going to die on that hill. And you're not going to either. <laughs> All right? All right, let's go further. We've covered the 12 elements. Now remember I brought this book in way back at the beginning. First day of class. And I mentioned it to you. Cumulative Index to the Grammar and Syntax of Biblical Hebrew. Compiled by Frederick Clark Putnam. It is in the uh, reference section of the library I believe. It has been in the past. I've told them to put it there and keep it there. It's not to be checked out. So even if you find it in the uh, regular stacks. Please don't check it out. You've got all the students in this class using it. You've got all the students in Dr. Grisanti's class using it. You've got all the students in Dr. Murphy's class using it. There are 90 some students using this right now. So please, please, please don't remove it. Don't keep it long. Just open it long enough to find your text and what pages. It'll be on either one or two pages only. No more than two pages photocopy those pages and then put it back where someone can see where it's at and get it and use it and follow on. But it will provide you with information. The pages look like this on the inside. And as you look at these pages, here is, it's in the Psalms and it tells you chapter 20 verse 8 which is the last reference down here. It begins at 18, 19, goes through 20 verse 8 and as it goes through here verse by verse it lists the references to Hebrew grammar reference books where you will find information that refers specifically to that verse. Okay, that verse might be used only as an example in a list of verses. But at least tells you that the writer of that grammar felt that the uh, one particular element of grammar in that verse was good to cite as an example of what he's talking about. And so go back and find what he's talking about and find out what he says about it. And sometimes they're even the example. They're the parade example of, of this particular element of grammar. And as you go through it, you'll see this little box here. That box indicates foreign language. So that means there are, those grammars are in German or in French or Italian. If you can read German, French, or Italian, go ahead and use them. If you don't, ignore them. All right? Just stick with the English. And down at the bottom is a key that, and this, this is found on every single page. So all you need to do is photocopy the single page for your text or the two pages at most for your text. And you will have the key at the bottom to tell you what the abbreviations stand for for each of the grammars. So if you do Psalm 19, there's all the references to the grammars in Psalm 19. Okay, Everyone understand what this is all about and how to use it? It's to help give you a kickstart. It's helped you to, to, to find resources, grammars, where your text is being discussed or used as an example. And it helps you to identify some of the grammatical elements in your text. Maybe something you hadn't even thought about, even when you translated it. Up close, you can see it a little bit clearer. 
how it goes along here. This is Davidson. This is Gazinius Couch Cowley. This is Juan Muraoka. This is Gibson. And then you start the German here by Brock. And then you have Davidson, you have Gazinus Couch Cowley, you have Walt Ken O'Connor, Introduction to Biblical Hebrew Syntax, you have Gibson, and then you have start the German, Bauer and Leander and Berg. And so those are the, the abbreviations and how they're used. And you can go to those references, those section numbers in those works, and you'll find where your verse is referred to. Okay? A little help. I will bring this with me next week. So that if we, you have photocopied that in preparation. So that you have it handy to refer to. And there are any questions. I will have mine here to refer to that as well. So it would be a good thing if you could get it done between now and next Thursday. Photocopy the one page or two page from that source. That refer to your text. Yes sir. Uh, we just looked up the, the Putnam book on Google Books. Yes. And it's actually available if your passage is from Isaiah or, um, or Joel. Sure. They don't have the Psalms passage. It, it, it has, it has uh, chunks of the book. Oh, available. chunks of the book are available online yeah. in so Google Books or what? Yeah. So Isaiah and Job are, are online. Isaiah, and, okay. And remember, if you access, if you as an individual access Google Book reference that way, even a chunk, a certain number of times, the whole thing will disappear for you. Uh, yeah, there's a, they've got a limit there. And it's, okay. it differs for each book. I mean, sometime, yeah, when you open it up, write down your information right away. Because you, you have no guarantee it will open back up a second time. It might open up ten times in a row and the eleventh time disappear. But sometimes I've had it disappear the second time. So keep that in mind with Google Books. Okay? Well, I would use the photocopied page first in your research and find out what it's like before you determine whether or not it's for you. Okay? That way you can save your shekels and spend them wisely. All right. Okay, let's go back to where we were in talking about uh, Chisholm. And uh, pick up where we left off the other day. And we'll pick up with this on some of the things we've just been talking about in this last 15 minutes. Let's talk about the definite article. As, it, as Chisholm describes it on pages 73 to 74. Remember uh, the rule of context. He points this out. The meaning of a definite article in Hebrew is dependent upon context. The definite article sometimes is translated the. Sometimes it's translated as a uh, uh, demonstrative pronoun. That. This. Sometimes it is not translated at all. Like on Hayom, which means literally the day or this day. But you just translate it as today. Okay? Today is Hayom. There are cases when the article is translated as a possessive pronoun. His day. Instead of yomo, hayom in a certain context could also be translated as his day. So context determines how you translate the article. Remember that the definite article is discussed in Hebrew Bible insert and it goes through all the variety of usages that it might have. Uh, let's take a look at a text in Genesis chapter 1. Wa Elohim et ha Adam but Salmo. Thus God created the man in his image. But Selim Elohim bara oto. In the image of God he created him. Zakar u nekeva bara otam. Male and female he created them. Now as we look at this we see that we end with them, but up here we have Ha-Adam. So is this really talking about just the man? Or is it more than that? You see, as we look at the article, it could mean that it's just the man. But it could be a generic use of the article, which means this is mankind or humankind. All right? The context is what determines it. Now the double repetition here of in, in the image of God. Here you have created, God created the man in his image. And in the image of God he created him. Notice that you have Betselem here and Betselmo here back to back. So it's on a diplosis. One line ends the Zakef Katon with Selem as the final uh, word and Selim is the first word of the next half, next part of the verse, the first half of the first half 
the second half of the, of the first half of the verse. Oto ends with the athnach, so there's the midpoint of the verse. But notice that the third portion of the verse is co-equal to all that went before. Because the athnach doesn't m mark the quantitative middle of the verse. It marks the logical midpoint of the verse. So what is said in the second logical half is co-equivalent to that which is in the first logical half. Therefore, since this moves on to talk and to define this as male and female, he created them, then this is the defining statement that tells us what this is all about. It also, if we understand it that way, we have from the very beginning the statement then that woman is also made in the image of God, not just the man. What happens if we decide that this is only about the man? Then when we get to Genesis 9-6, then no one suffers capital punishment if they kill a woman. Because she's not in the image of God. Now try arguing that with your wife. Try telling her that the way you interpret Genesis results in her devaluation and her life no longer counts anymore. That if someone kills her, that's all right. But if they kill you, they got to die for it. Stop to think about that, gentlemen. And, but that's exactly some of the foolishness that happens in wrongful exegesis of the text. Because people get all hung up on this. And they'll jump to Genesis 5 2 and say, well, look here. Uh, it, you have Abel being uh, born and he is in the likeness of Adam. So isn't this only talking about males? Absolutely not. Not according to Genesis 9 6. Not according to Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and 27. Because this first half is before the Athnach. The second half is after the Athnach. This is an explanatory half. This is the summarizing half. This is the interpretive half. And it tells you what this means up here. Therefore Ha'adam must be translated as mankind. It's generic. God created human beings in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And then later in chapter 2, we're going to have that broken down to describe exactly how God created the man and exactly how God created the woman. But it's mankind, and it's mankind that is in the image of God. The generic use of the article is very significant here. Context, context, context. If you cut off this last part of the verse and forget about it, you could end up with a wrong understanding. You have to look at the context. You have to pay attention to the context. Particles. We talked about the eighth being emphatic. I want to show you an example. Genesis chapter 2 verse 8. Here you have wa yasem sham. So he, it's God by context, placed there the man. Eth ha adam esher yatsar. Whom he had formed. Now, this is in chapter 2, verse 8. Woman doesn't come into the picture in chap until chapter 2, verse 21 and following. This is before the woman is made. This is only the man. And that's why the F is being used. Because the reader has just read what we just read about male and female being ha-adam. So the reader's mind is already focused on Ha-Adam being both male and female, right? Because you read the context. And the flow as you come on down, then you interpret it that way. The writer, Moses, gives us a clue. He puts F in here as a marker to say, hold on a minute. This is emphatic. It's only the man. So he placed there the man whom he had formed. Not the woman. The woman does not yet exist. The man. Again, this is by context again. You have to read several more verses before you understand that this is an emphatic eighth to make certain we clearly understand that it's the man and the man alone. And eighth is your first clue to consider that. Yes, sir? You mentioned that eighth also makes the whatever word it's connected to definite. Correct. And this also has the definite article. Right. Is Which that often occurs. Right. So is that important? But when it's, when it's important is when there is no definite article on the noun. In other words, you could have this article left off here. 
Now because the article is on there, this helps to make this emphatic rather than just simple making definite. But eth can be found on any noun with the article or without the article, but whatever the, uh, that noun has, it is definite regardless because of the eth. So this article makes it emphatic? This eighth makes it emphatic. The eighth does. Right. Okay. Eighth is never used on an indefinite noun. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm just a little confused because uh, the reference before also had an eighth with the, with the noun. So mm -hmm. is that... Same thing. St they're still talking about the same thing. They're talking only about the man. I chose one example. I didn't choose every example in here. Okay. I, mean, I think the one that we just quoted from Genesis 1 about the image of God. Mm -hmm. So he said he made man in his image? Uh, he made mankind in his image. Did that one have the eighth? So well, let's go back take a look at it here. Yep. Yes, it does. And there... The eighth is talking about man, mankind, and it's to point out that he makes man. That is not necessarily emphatic here by context, because the flow here, if you go back and look at it, you're, you've got man being referred to all the way through. But in the, the next context, it's a different context, and you have a situation in which, if you don't take that as emphatic, you end up with uh, making the man and woman being placed in the, in the uh, Garden of Eden. And then that confuses everything because you have to wait another uh, 10 verses before you get to the making of the woman. She's not even made yet. Okay? So he placed the man, not the woman, is the idea, whom he had formed there. Yes, sir? So the, the way you have it, is that the way you would translate it? No, I wouldn't put not the woman in parentheses, no. <laughs> or in brackets. He placed the man whom he had formed there is the way I'd translate it. So is, is Sham, is that there? Yeah, Sham is why there. Wouldn't you, why wouldn't you translate that? It is. It's right here. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Sorry, I missed something on, on Genesis 126. Mm -hmm. It had the, the eighth marker. Mm -hmm. Right, and as we were saying. You're not translating it as definite. No, it is definite. Well, it, you know, you could say humankind and human beings. In English, you can't put the the on it and make sense in English. That's the problem. This is why I say you don't always translate every article. God created the human beings. God created human beings is the way we say it in English. Not the. Okay? And we don't say God created the mankind. That, that really throws up red flags. When you translate that way, that gets the D under the letter under the word in your translation in red, you know, that means poor English. Now, this is a case where the cannot be used in English. It's still definite. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Uh, again, going back to the Genesis 1. <laughs> right. I, I, you guys are bound to try to get your wives to be less than what you are? Is that what you're after? In? We've got a lady over here witnessing this. Okay, go ahead. The third mass and singular phenomenal suffix. On Salmo. On object. Bet Salmo. No, on the object marker. Oto. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right there. That's third mass and singular, right? Correct. I, how can you translate that as them? Then? I don't no, I didn't translate it as them. I translate this as them. Otam. What? Third the mass and plural here. In the translation. It's okay, well this, this is what... Chisholm is translating it with because he's taking this as a collective singular. Okay? Right, collective singular. Okay? Good question. Thanks for catching it and looking at it. All right? All right, let's move on. We've got to get to the one more emphatic eighth here. All right? You're all familiar with Isaiah and his vision at the temple in Isaiah chapter 6? All right? Whom shall I send? Eth me eshlach. Whom shall I send? That is an emphatic eighth. Eighth is very rarely used before me as a uh, interrogative pronoun. It means whom exactly should I send? Or as Walt Ken O'Connor suggests, who in the world will I send? It's emphatic. You want to preach a sermon on missions from Isaiah 6? Get it right. Get the emphasis right. 
Whom exactly should I send? Whom in the world should I send? The idea is, all right, someone has to be sent. Who's it going to be? Let's identify that individual or individuals. Okay, it's emphatic. Verb stems, the nifal. We talked about this uh, uh, briefly on the nifal uh, participle. We'll get to that in a second here. But in Genesis 3, 5, when nifkahu a nekem, do we translate as their, your eyes will open themselves? Your eyes will be opened or just your eyes opened? Well, it's will open if it's middle. It's will be opened if it's passive. And in this case, it is a passive. You see it later down in 3.7 where you have the same nifal used of an imperfect, the same verb, fo- verb, verb root, with the, the eyes of the two of them. So the eyes of the two of them were opened. We see it in Isaiah 35.5. Then the eyes of the blind were opened. And notice that in all these cases, the nifal uh, seems to have a passive sense. In other words, the agent, the one who actually opens, is not stated. It's not identified. It's understood to be God. That God is opening the eyes. It's called a divine passive. And it's discussed in uh, Bib Sack uh, in 1983 article. It's also discussed in Grace Theological Journal in 1989 article. And if you go to the uh, uh, Berit Olam uh, commentary series on literature, the narrative literature context talk about divine passives and the one on uh, numbers uh, Leviticus numbers and Deuteronomy lists literally scores of divine passives in the Pentateuch where the passive understands that it is God who is the agent but the passive is used to avoid mentioning him specifically uh, the the participles are adjectival as in Genesis 3 6 desirable the tree is desirable to make one wise it's an adjectival or potential use. You just add the A-B-L-E. And you'll see that in Hebrew Bible insert section 2.1.3b where that is discussed. Keep in mind adjectival participles in nifal. And then the P-L and pu'al. Uh, we're just going to introduce this. And we'll come back and continue it next week. But in Genesis 2-3 we have and he sanctified it. This is talking about the seventh day. God sanctified it. That is a factative. It literally means he brought it the seventh day into the state or condition of being holy. How do we determine a factative? The subject of the PL verb brings the object of the verb into the state or condition expressed by the cal stative of that verb. Kadash means he was holy or be holy. When you have that be used, that tells you it's a stative verb. It's describing a condition, not an action. Therefore, in the cal, if it's stative, in the pl, it's going to be factative. So the subject will bring the object into the state or condition described by the cal stative. Okay? Gadol, he was great. To be great. When you put that in a hif, uh, uh, a, a PL form, that becomes he will make great. He will bring that person or object into the condition or state of being great. That's what we mean by factative. It is really a form of causative to make someone great, to make someone holy.